What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Jay Haleen. We are back with another exclusive episode of In the Studio. I got my Sara power player here, Dr. D. Bell here. She is an educator. She is a motivator. And she's a leadership expert. You know, um, I, I was blown away by her. I was telling her off camera. And I heard her talking. She's giving her take. Um, we, were, we were in the same leadership group. And I was like, I have to talk to her more. I, I need to get her... And, and, then, and I felt I was on vacation wow. <laughs> at that time. You know, I was really on vacation. So I said, listen, but it's, it's, the group is very good. So I still got up at 7 o'clock to make sure. <laughs> I went back to sleep. I'll be honest. I went back to sleep. <laughs> but I did get up to participate. And I was happy that I was able to um, find a pearl, <laughs> you know, um, in that class. So um, thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time. Absolutely. No problem at all. It's a pleasure for me to be here. It's, it's, it's a, um, definitely a pleasure for me to have you. So tell me about your culture focused teaching. Cause you know, we, we, you know, for me, teachers, I quit, I quit teachers with like um, police officers, even though police officers aren't the, the um, we don't have a uh, good things to say about police officers right now. But I think that if police officers do policing, right. Yeah, they can actually be um, an asset to the community, and I think they're overlooked. The ones that's doing the right thing, underpaid, and the same as the teachers. Yeah. Very, very important, you know. But again, uh, overlooked, underpaid. Not you know, not really the good ones, because there's some ones that you know that's very, very bad there too. But you figured out a way, you know, to help out not just the teachers but also um, problem students. So tell us about the co culture-focused teaching. Well, um, culture-focused teaching is actually in a system that I'm actually, uh, that I've built um, into a curriculum and I actually spell it all out in my new Amazon best-selling book, Culture-Focused Teaching. You can find it on amazon.com or my website, www.culturefocusteaching.com. And basically what culture focused teaching is all about is helping teachers understand how important it is to build culture within their classrooms. And I know when people hear culture, they think about ethnicity, they think about people's uh, racial background, they think about the societal movement like pop culture, and different things of that nature. But more simply, culture is how we do things. Yeah. And I think that, I personally believe through research and it shows us that when educators have a consistent culture where both the teacher and the student understand the expectations, then this will allow teachers to really teach, which is what they are supposed to be coming to school for, not necessarily being harsh disciplinarians or, um, you know, having to deal with um, disciplinary issues for the majority of their teaching time. The objective with culture focused teaching is allowing teachers to see that if they create a culture, for example, of vulnerability, if they create a culture where students understand that they're valued in the class, if they create a culture where the teacher has taught the students the value of teachers, you know, within the schools and within the class, then you build this sort of ecosystem of, you know, of an environment where there is an understanding that students come to school to learn and teachers come to school to teach. Though there are going to be some situations in the class because children will be children. Mm -hmm. That's a natural thing. We've all been down that road before where we've done something that we weren't supposed to do or said something that we weren't supposed to say. However, with creating a culture-focused teaching environment, there's a system that each individual teacher sets up in their classroom where instead of, you know, creating these uh, harsh uh, punishment levels, but making the, the uh, consequence appropriate with the infraction, like yeah. um, building an environment where students can make mistakes because they know that if they come to you and if they make it right, then you're there for them and not feeling like you're going to cast them out yeah. for making a mistake. So you're building like this ecosystem of vulnerability, of responsibility, 
accountability and really sharing one for another, caring um, one for another as it relates to what the roles and the responsibilities are in the classroom. There's so many different dynamics within the book and within the system that teachers can use and, and it basically helps them teach um, more fluidly um, and they're less stressed yeah. because they've created a system now works with and without their presence. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, there are several steps, there are several strategies that I use inside of the book, again, to help teachers understand, one, that we need them in the classroom. We cannot mobilize our communities. We cannot move forward without educators in the classroom. I always tell people who are, and you mentioned police, um, you know, the police department and policing and doing that appropriately. And I know that we're calling for criminal justice reform and, and other types of reform, but I always tell people there is no health care reform, no criminal justice reform or economic reform without educational reform. Yeah. You have to have educational practices in place that afford those that are in the field the right spaces where they're able to operate where they're not burnt out where they don't hate their jobs where they come in with a with an equitable mindset to teach every one of those students regardless of their backgrounds and that's white black asian whatever their black backgrounds are those teachers come in with a culture focused mind that this classroom is set up where we're going to respect each other and we're going to respect our differences so there are just so many like different components to it, but the objective is to uh, empower our teachers because, of course, we are in what I call in the book an educational fugitive crisis mm -hmm. where teachers have just left the building. They have left the field, and um, we actually are now minimizing that effort even more from the college level where people, uh, students are coming in saying that they're going to major in education, but by the time they graduate, they've already switched their majors. I I've been there. So, I've been, yeah. <laughs> I've been there. I, I, I'll be honest with you. Um, I heard in South Carolina that you can become, if you become an education major and you go to school, they'll pay, you know, they pay off your, your loans. But I was a business major and I tried to take it as a, a minor. One class, I quit. <laughs> so, uh, but that was 20 plus years ago. But I, I, um, I, I definitely understand that. But you, you have a progressive idea. So I don't know how long you've been doing this, but I just imagine what was some of the um, pushback that you got? Because a lot of times people have their, their programs in place and you're coming with something so progressive. They're like, eh, I don't know, that new stuff, that newfangled stuff. So what was some of the pushback that you got? Um, I've actually, I literally just launched this this year. Okay. I started working on it um, 2018 into 2019 and I launched it at the beginning of the year. And I thought it was very funny um, to be honest with you, I thought God was playing a trick on me because I'm like, you know, I felt led, strongly led to do this work. And then we hit a pandemic <laughs> in the middle of it. So I literally launched my book in the middle of the pandemic. It was mm. in March when everything kind of hit the fan. Yeah. I launched my book because that was a set date that we had. And, you know, um, it wasn't ideal. I actually wanted to launch like late last year yeah, yeah. um but everything kind of fell to where we launched this year and it honestly was perfect after i settled my mind and was like whoa this is very different um here and um i've actually was traveling prior to the shutdown mm -hmm. of COVID 19. i had traveled to several states i literally just got off the, i was hot off the plane from london right before they shut the country down yeah. so i literally just got back in the states um from uh sharing this research in London. And wow. so it is very, very new. Um, I'm getting support, but some of the pushback that I am getting, and I think it's natural with any field, is because it's so very new. People want to see a little bit more um, research. People want to see a little bit more um, peer review um, regarding uh, the information and the research that I'm doing. And so I've had a little bit of pushback, um, even when I'm training, um, because I do get into a lot of sticky areas, especially when we start talking about um, racial diversity and how the curriculum is so, um, the disparity of what's represent, represented for uh, black people and people of color is, you know, I, I get into that and how, how many less teachers we have of color than we do white teachers, but we have majority black and brown students in the class. Yeah. And so I have to get into talking about how that affects these children, especially in their formative years, which, you know, majority of elementary school teachers are white and female. 
And yeah. so you take, you know, majority black and brown children and you put them in that environment where if the teachers are not culturally sensitive, if they're not building a culture of, of understanding of differences, not just of racial cultures, but socioeconomic cultures. Yeah. Um, because, you know, if you don't understand, you know, I'll just use example, I'm here. Um, you know, in the in the city. And so if you are a white teacher teaching, you know, at an elementary school, uh, let's say you are at one of the elementary schools in Richland School District 1. If you don't understand the socioeconomic dynamics of a child coming from 48, which is Bluff Road, mm -hmm. then you're not going to really be able to really understand why this child may bring this particular behavior, this type of language, this type of understanding into the class. You're going to fight against it rather than open an opportunity for understanding of where that child comes from. I talk to teachers when I'm doing um, training. I let them know that the first thing you, especially uh, early teachers, teachers um, now that are working between the first and the fifth year um, in their schooling, make sure you do a great job of understanding the demographics of the areas where you're serving because it'll help you understand the culture where your children come from. Because you can have two people from the same race but still come from different cultures. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. What, what, what do you do with, the, what, what, do you have a program where you include parents in this, in, in this, um, in your, um, in your program, in the system? Because again, I think that, I know me being a parent of um, elementary and middle school kids, I'm heavily involved, but you know, I just always wanted that for my kids. But, you know, coming from our community, that's not always the case. So um, how do you include the parents in your system? What's funny about that is I actually used to be a parent liaison, which um, I pretty much saw that there was a gap between what the parents really knew, what was happening at the school, versus what was actually happening at the school and so um I, I felt like that was where also where teachers were getting frustrated and feel like there was a lack of parental involvement and different things of that nature and so i felt like there was a need to bridge the gap and there are several parent liaisons you know in different school districts and and all across the nation and i usually um because i've been that that in that position i usually go through the parent liaison and ask questions about what's needed um what are some of the different dynamics that the parent parents may need in order to be more effective um, when it comes to being in the classroom. Um, but I have different people that I pull on and I reach out to to more so assist the parents. Yeah. My focal point with the teachers is helping them understand how important that parental relationship is for them to have that connection with the parents. Because I always, and I say this in the book, I call the parents the lucky charms. Mm -hmm. If you can build a relationship, a workable relationship as a teacher with a parent or a guardian or a foster parent, whomever is over, you know, that child's life, if you can build a, a, a great relationship there, then you'll begin to see changes in children by leaps and bounds yeah. because i call it um the great triangle you have you know the the student at the top you got the teacher and the parent that are working together to get this child to mobilize forward because we're trying to push our kids forward and so they're going to need that support they're going to need the support of the teacher the support of that parent and guardian to work together so i always emphasize the importance of that relationship because it's it's it will do leaps I mean, wonders, leaps and yeah. bounds. Your children will move and grow by leaps and bounds. And not just uh, behaviorally, but academically. I agree. When, when children know that they have a partnership that's working for them, rather than one person on one side and one person on the other, they will do amazing things in our classroom. I totally agree. I totally agree. So this is the big elephant in the room. What causes teacher burnout? Man. There's so many things that 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 cause teacher burnout, but I think that the the four top things that I deal with in my book is uh, first of all lack of understanding of their role as a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, many times they they come in and they feel like oh I'm just gonna decorate my class I'm gonna you know make it all beautiful and then they get in there and they have 28 to 30 different kids, 30 different personalities from 30 different cultures. And you're expected to teach and move these children from one part of the bar to the next. And you're like, how in the world did I do this with 30 different levels 
of, of, of different types of students. So I think that's very jarring at when, when teachers come in expecting to do one thing and they, they realize, wait a minute, I've got to do something else. This is taking a little bit more work than I expected. Because a lot of people think that teaching is easy. Going into the field is easy. And going into the classrooms are easy. It is totally not easy. There are a lot of sacrifices that you have to make as an educator. You have to make sacrifices. You think it's easy now? With that, that they had homeschool for two months? <laughs> Look, I, at this point, they most of them will probably, most parents will probably admit that y'all can have this. <laughs> this is for the birds. And I think that they will have a greater appreciation for educators. Yes, ma'am. But, you know, prior to COVID-19, um, you know, people did think that, you know, educators just had it easy. You know, and, and then that was a, a lot of that conversation um, in there. But, um, you know, we don't. There's a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice. There's, we sacrifice our family time. We sometimes sacrifice our vacation time to ensure that we tutor students, we grade papers, we keep grades up to date, we keep attendance up to date. There's so many other things um, that we have to make sure we do it day in and day out. And I just think a lot of educators, a lot of educators who are coming in, um, especially our new age educators, they're just not familiar with a, lo a lot of what goes into it. And so helping them understand what they're getting into is one of the things that will help prevent the burnout. Um, also, behavior. Many of them did not expect to deal with so many different behavior issues in the classroom. And I talk about how, and, and a lot of people don't want to talk about it, but I talk about how um, many of our students um, that we're teaching now versus the ones that when I was going to school and, and when I first started teaching, you know, we have a mental health crisis and it is on the rise. And so many of our teachers are teaching students with several diagnosed and undiagnosed mental health issues. And it may not, when people hear mental health, they automatically think of like special education or some type of, of you know, um, physical impairment, but mental health can be as simple as a child who lost their dad to war. Their, their, their child, their, their parent was in the military and they lost him to war and they're just, they just can't function yeah. after losing dad. And yeah. so they deal with depression. That's mental health. You yeah. know, you know, there, there are people who are children who are living in just, you know, circumstances that are just not good for them, but it's all they have. Yeah. And so they're trying to function. So yeah. those are all different things that are coming to the classroom. And so you see it acted out in their behavior. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, um, speaking on that, it's going to be a lot of trauma coming into the next school year after COVID-19. And, you know, um, so I, I, what, what do you say to the teachers or what are you guys preparing for coming into August, September of 2020 with whatever the new school year looks like? <laughs> nobody really actually knows. What are some of the things you're preparing to do for that? Um, some of the things that I already kind of have in the forefront, honestly, just to be quite frank with you, the work that I've done is a very, like you said, progressive work, but I also think it's a timely work because it's talking about a lot of what I didn't even know was going to happen. When I started this work last year, had no idea that we were going to be in a pandemic and then, you know, now we have national, international, you know, issues with race and, and, and you know, all these different movements. I had no idea when I wrote this book. So basically what I would encourage educators and schools to do if you are a principal and you are listening, make sure that your teachers are getting as much professional development as possible. I know that we can't go into a lot of spaces where there are a lot of people because we're still practicing social distancing, but I will definitely say for example, next week, I'm actually doing a webinar, um, you know, for educators. This one, of course, is specifically um, helping them how, helping teachers understand how, how to have the conversation about racial um, issues, uh, racism, social injustices without losing control of their class. Because that's kind of one of the big things is like, how do we do this without, you know, children feeling a certain kind of way? And parents may not agree, you know, there's gonna be so many different things that we're gonna to have to tackle going into the school year. Also, those coming from experiences with COVID-19. Some children would have experienced death in their families, sicknesses from their family members. So it's going to take a lot of professional development. And guess what? Let's rely on the, and on the things that we know we can do. 
That means have compassion, be patient, be willing to listen, and be willing to learn. Those are four things that we can do. We don't need a class to understand compassion. We don't need a class to understand patience. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We don't need classes to understand how to listen and how to learn. Those are things that we can actually do when we settle ourselves. Yeah. And then, of course, we would want our school districts to make sure that there are appropriate professional development um, seminars and workshops in place. If you need to find a place to start, definitely make sure you check out the website, culturefocusteaching.com. Have several packages there definitely. that we can actually come in and do a professional development workshop. Definitely. Listen, this has been amazing. I am so glad I said I, I need to talk to her because this is real conversation. This is, I mean, I know this is supposed to be an interview, but I love real conversation and um, it's needed. You know, we can talk about the business mumbo jumbo and it's important. But again, um, one of my favorite quotes by Frederick Douglass is, is better to build strong children than repair broken men. Absolutely. And I think that this is the answer for all of these problems that we're talking about is to go in, into the next 20 years, getting a kid that's five years old and getting them prepared right now to be better human beings, to have better mental health, to have better health practices, um, you know, get them to play well with others. <laughs> And, and all of those things, I think that that's what needs to happen. So I think we start from grassroots with our babies and encourage them to be police officers, but with a good hearts. Correct. Coming from, you know, this crazy backgrounds and, and then also having the right mindset. Because a lot of people get the police officer's job and, the, and teaching jobs for the wrong reasons. Yeah. You know, you get people want to police, be a police officer because you feel like you can go and do anything you want to do. And um, with no consequence, he want to be um, teachers because they get summers off and all that other stuff like that. And it's the wrong thing. It's too important yeah. for it not to be a calling of yours as opposed to just a job. Right. You know, so um, you're an educator. I, I imagine you didn't stay. You, cho you chose not to stay. Even if you started in the classroom, you chose not to stay where you started. And that's one of the things I see in those two professions. That's why I always lump them together. It's so important, but a lot of people get in the second grade class at 25 years old, and next thing you know, they're there at 45. Yep. And you didn't move on. And I just did something on my group, and I'll invite you. But I just said, what you use to survive is not what you're going to be able to use to thrive. And so that second grade class probably worked for you at 25, but you're out of position at 45. You could have grown and did so much more and took your life experiences and showing somebody else something else, but being out of position, don't we, we, you know, people are not being helped. And I think that, you know, to add, that leads to burnout, that leads to frustration on the job, that leads to people doing things that they don't have any business doing because you're not in proper position. So um, I really, really wanted to have this opportunity to talk with you. So, and, and it's been great. It's been better than what I even thought. So I really appreciate you so much. And let everybody know, again, that website, your social media, everything. Um, I got the book already. Y'all go ahead and get the book. And we're going to see y'all see it right here on the screen. Go get the book. I got the book. I'm in the middle of reading it right now. So y'all go ahead and uh, get that too. But let everybody know how to find you. Sure. You can find me at www.culturefocusteaching.com. That is specifically uh, the website where the book can be located, as well as the Culture Focus Teaching um, crash course, which is available, as well as the Classroom Management Mastery e-course. All of those um, items are there available. The book is an additional tool that you can use um, uh, with taking the courses, or if you need individual coaching and training as an educator, you can also reach out to me. There are packages there available for that. If you are a school principal or you work in a position of leadership within a school, please be sure to look at the packages that are on the website for you. There are three different packages where I can do workshops, day workshops, half day workshops, and also book studies with you and your uh, teachers within your school. So make sure you check those out. Um, I'm also at www.drdunlimited.com. That is my author speaker website. That is where you can find me to, you know, do keynote speak, uh, speeches, where you can um, just find me, you know, there as a, as a workshop presenter. That's that particular website where you want to go. If those of you who are adamant about social media, 
If you're out there on Instagram or Twitter, um, if you're in social media world, I can be found at Culture Focus Teaching, um, and that's on Instagram, or at Dr. D Unlimited, that's D-R-D-E-E, unlimited and that's at instagram and twitter so you can find me in those spaces and you can reach out to me i would love to hear from each and every one of you i always tell people doctors save lives but teachers change lives yeah, we gotta hashtag that <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much y'all already know i told y'all this is going to be exclusive y'all know how to find me www.jhalim.com youtube.com backslash jhalim tv and I am Jay Halim on all social media platforms. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you so much again, Dr. Deesh, my Sarah. Love my one of, one of my pearls. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you know, you guys catch us in the studio next time. See you later. Peace. See you later.